Ladies and gentlemen, open finance pioneers, how are you all doing? And a big warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us around our campfire. Now, you told us that security in the world of open finance was a hot topic that you wanted to talk about. We heard you. And we see this reflected in the extraordinary registration numbers for our campfire today. Now, we have an amazing panel from across the industry to have this debate with you. So to set the scene, I wonder, with banks being heavily fined for money laundering, are the funds flowing through fintech? It's a rhetorical question, really, for us to focus on where the bad actors will be moving to. Now, this is a conversation that we will be continuing throughout the year with more campfires and our soon to be launched blog. It needs to be continuous, it affects us all, and it's too important and far too wide for it just to be a one-off. It requires true industry collaboration, which is a great segue for me to thank all of our partners that have worked with us behind the scenes, and in particular, our masterclass from FinTrail. Thank you, John Paul. Now, we're starting our conversation around security, looking at SCA, Secure Customer Authentication, and the part it has to play in making open finance secure. Collaboration has to be at the heart of tackling this issue. It certainly is at the heart of our amazing global industry community. So we are absolutely proud to shine a light on the collaborative work that OK and Banfico are doing. This is FinTech at its very, very best. OK, so a couple of housekeeping points from me uh, before I hand over to our guest host, Daniel Lanyon, Managing Editor of AltFi. Now, please ask the panelists the questions. You can see um, we're running a poll on Slido. There's also on Slido, you can ask questions as well. Uh, we always post the uh, poll results on LinkedIn, so do look out for those. Most of you will be familiar now with Karina and her absolutely stunning graphic recording that you can see going on at the side of the screen. Now, I have one big ask. We believe in karma, and I would love, absolutely love this to be the year where we raise a colossal amount for our charities. It's super simple. You can make a charity donation using the QR code that you can see at the bottom of your screen. It's an open banking payment. So come on, please be generous and um, make a donation. So without further ado, get a little closer to our campfire, get involved on Slido, um, make a donation, and please join in our debate with what it happens to be an awesome panel from across the industry. I am delighted to pass the mic over to Daniel. So without further ado, Daniel, thank you and over to you. Uh, thank you, Helen, and good afternoon uh, to everybody tuning in uh, from a sunny London, I'm pleased to say. Uh, my name is Daniel Langan, Editor-in-Chief of AltFi. Uh, if you've not heard of us uh, before, we're a leading publication covering fintech and the broad innovation in financial services. Uh, we've been going since 2013. We're in a lot of uh, events and newsletters and, uh, of course, publish a lot of stories too. So go and check us out at altfi.com. Um, now, open banking and uh, open finance by extension um, is certainly one of the trends that I'm personally uh, most bullish on over the long term. Um, I, I liken it a bit to the, the start of um, you know, the motor car industry, if you think, you know, the first few decades, you had brands coming along, um, you know, and car companies really establishing themselves. And then, you know, it's not really until the, the let's say, the, the decades after that, when you start to see the second and third order effects, um, you know, companies like Walmart, which would have been unimaginable if you think about it at, at, at that time. So I think, you know, open banking really represents um, something akin to that. Um, and, and we are obviously going to be discussing the very important uh, subject of security 
um, to, I guess, uh, power that journey. So joining me today, we have, um, as Helen said, a fantastic group of speakers. Alex Roy uh, is Head of Consumer Distribution Policy at the Financial Conduct Authority, the UK financial regulator. Uh, Fabian um, Ignolo, CEO of OK, a strong customer authentication solution for banks and fintechs that's compliant with PSD2. Uh, Kanan Rasapan, CEO of uh, Banifico, Banifico, which helps small banks with PSD compliance. Uh, Gavin Littlejohn, Chairman of the Financial Data and Technology Association. Peter Belaskus, Financial Crime Fraud Manager at the banking challenger Revolut, which has been around, I think, since about 2015 and now has about 30 million customers. And I am one of those, Peter. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so let, let's kick off. Uh, Peter, obviously, for Revolut, um, user experience is, is absolutely key. Um, it's what you've obviously prioritized uh, in your first five years growing, um, you know, growing the product. Um, do you think there is currently an inherent tension between UX user experience uh, and security when it comes to open banking? Oh, well, thanks a lot. Thank you for, for inviting me, uh, first of all, uh, for being part of this important debate. Um, very, very excited to be here. So, yes, uh, I mean, in answer to your question, traditionally, I think, or so we say uh, at the beginning of open banking, this was very much the, the view that, that, that there is this sort of uh, head on sort of contrast between the two. Um, however, as things develop um, and, and, and we sort of embrace the, the progression and the technology and how they can actually work together to achieve the very much the same goals. Um, the question highlights this big debate, right? Um, and, it, and it's still ongoing uh, and it's changing and emerging and evolving. So I think depending on where we're talking about, so obviously within the UK, we have the SCA um, and uh, it's a good baseline for security standards um, and it can effectively be used as an example for others to follow. Um, and staying within the app is obviously crucial, right? Uh, and, and being able to make sure the experience uh, is seamless and within the app, it, is you know keeping the clicks down and, and making sure that we complete the security but in a way that's as discreet or as seamless as possible and i think that's that's really where the focus should be going forward there is obviously um crude ways to get uh, the security uh, checks done um but i think with what's available and uh, how we're developing um in this space we have the potential to really make that seamless and, and keep it to the minimum um, so that we get obviously the benefit of the security but obviously don't have to do it in a way which is obstructive and, and jeopardizes the whole ux experience okay interesting um fabian what, what are your thoughts um, on on that sort of uh, tension let's say thank you for having me here too uh, delighted i i think yes um uh, security and ux it's a big equation to solve uh, as as uh, Peter just put it, and but beyond open banking, when consumers really care about shopping and they don't really care about the payment experience, which has to be, you know, as transparent as can be, and especially when you add security uh, to it. But you still can, you know, build a great user experience or good user experiences because there's a hierarchy when you come, when it comes to strong customer authentication. There's a hierarchy of the authentication methods, you know, and if you. I mean, Peter was talking about app-based authentication. Um, you know, you have to stick to what users are used to. Uh, and if you manage to do that, you know, you use your smartphone for the, for the possession factor, and then you would use uh, biometrics as the uh, as a second factor and, 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 you know, notify the user through push notifications. They're used to that when they have to, you know, authenticate. And, you know, this is as frictionless as can be. And then second comes, you know, uh, the use of knowledge uh, factor. So it's a secret code that you would enter into the interface a bit, you know, less frictionless. And then third of the list uh, would be using OTP, uh, whether it's by SMS or via apps, you know, and then it is more friction because you have to enter a one-time password into a separate interface or, you know, a, a web browser. And then bottom of the list, which is very <laughs> friction, which brings a lot of friction is, you know, all the fallback mechanisms that you put in place for people not having smartphones. Now, yes, you have, you do have friction there and, you know, it could be a remote call. It, it is compliant, uh, of course, to PSD2, but it brings friction. 
And it's not just a small thing, you know, for tier one banks, you're looking at 20 to 30% of the user base having, not having smartphones. So not able to do app-based authentication. Okay, really, really interesting. Um, um, Gavin, perhaps um, you could just share some thoughts as well on, on this. Um, you know, what, what are you sort of seeing, um, I guess, you know, from, from your um, perch? Well, there's obviously uh, payment initiation to contemplate and account information, and the needs of the two markets are slightly different. In payment initiation as a single immediate payment, it's important that there's a proper question that is asked of the of the customer so that they know that what what amount they're authorizing and to whom. In account information services, the background to, to open banking is data sharing. And the customer typically shares that data and they need to know what data they're sharing and for what purpose. So there should be an element of friction during the setup of the uh, data sharing access so that the customer is completely clear that they're consenting to a particular business model and they're consenting to a given fine-grained amount of data to fulfill the business model. But constantly then challenging the customer to come back and re-authenticate is creating unnecessary friction. So I think it's about getting the balance right depending on the use case. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds when we move into a combination which will be variable recurring payments where we have the opportunity if this all goes through intact where the end customer could choose to provide to a third party provider and enforce consent to act as their agent to move money to where it's most needed. Um, that, that will create some interesting conundrums around the trade-off between uh, consent and, and security. But the way it was set up at the moment for data sharing, as we may come on to talk about things like 90-day re-off uh, in a minute, um, you know, haven't been conducive to the policies that underpin the Competition and Markets Authority order for open banking, nor PSD2, which were primarily improving innovation, improving competition and improving security. It does none of those. So um, we need to kind of have a rethink there. Yeah, really, really interesting. Obviously you've seen um, the, the emergence and the evolution of open banking, um, you know, in the UK, obviously, uh, last three years, but um, yeah, and, and then around the world uh, as well, I understand. Uh, I think I heard something like, and there's about 10,000 uh, TPP third-party providers uh, actively working now, you know, on on uh, open banking uh, globally. Um, what I wonder is, you know, have we um, sort of hit a ceiling um, you know, of that sort of balance between uh, UX and innovation and security? Is that, you know, what what do you think, Gavin, on that? Do you think there is maybe we're we're sort of hitting a ceiling? No, I think there'll be more elegant technology solutions emerge that enable the customer to um, clearly enable the things they wish to enable, but not have to work so hard to do so. And um, some of the implementations we've seen, which have been PSD2 compliant, have been very nice journeys. Others have been confused and complicated, including some implementations which uh, don't enable a single party in a joint account to enable data to be shared which is quite strange. I can go and empty the entire account and steal all the money you know, from my partner, but I can't share my data with a money management app. It does seem a kind of improbable balance, and hopefully those sorts of things will be removed in the uh, tidy up that's going on at the moment, uh, led by the regulator. And um, Karen, what are, what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, have, have we hit a bit of a ceiling? Is there, is there sort of a need for the new innovation? Yes, it's, I mean, in terms of the fintech community, it's it's growing, and uh, you know, and the adoption, as we have seen from the three years, it's, it's been very gradual in UK, and the innovations, and you know, all of this are adding to that thing. So if there is too much friction, you know, big tech players are not coming into the market, you know, because they know there is a friction, the the stability of the APIs and stuff. So I think over the time it will build up, and you know what we are talking here is, uh, um, you know, 
banking experience provided by fintechs, not by banks. Uh, the experience, yeah, banks will become fintechs one day or sooner um, to protect their interest. But yes, it, it, it's going to grow in the, it's going to have a positive trajectory. Mm, interesting. Um, you know, I, I would love it if we could do a sort of, um, you know, a show of hands in the audience about who has used open banking or, um, or you know, something similar, you know, let's say in the last seven days. I mean, I, I actually did myself um, this morning, I was using free trade an app here in the UK and, um, you know, they sort of cut the, the balance of um, uh, how much you can add using Apple Pay. So I was like, oh, I'll use, I'll use the open banking uh, solution. Um, and I thought it was, you know, I thought it was, it was pretty good. I was pretty impressed, but I thought, it, you know, it's not as easy as Apple Pay. And, and obviously, um, you know, that, I guess, seems to be something you want to work towards. But um, um, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe if we just go back to Peter, I mean, what are your thoughts on whether we've hit a uh, bit of ceiling at, like, obviously, inside Revolut, it'd be interesting to, to hear about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I view absolutely not. I think there's there's plenty of uh, you know capacity to, to innovate more in that area, and it, it's really more of a you know a collaboration piece um, to make sure that you know everyone is focusing on achieving the same uh, innovation. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously we have uh, different. There are slightly different goals and how people are focusing, but I think the the collaboration on you know on security is is, is hugely important in. In getting to that point, um, with that that seamless and the sort of checks that you can do uh, in the backgrounds, um, you know, with, with even with with clicks, if you have the confidence, um, and you know, you can do your name checks, your device checks, and everything else without actually uh, causing that friction, then you're onto a winner, really. And there's there's definitely a lot of space for improvement, in my view. Yeah, really, really interesting. Um, An interesting conundrum, um, Daniel, in the United States, where the sort of data sharing element of open banking began uh, 20 years ago, the, pen, the market penetration um, in the whole population is about 30%. In the UK, we're now about 3%. But the important thing for everybody to remember is that in the United States, it was the big banks who went first. It was, you know, you could, you could log into your city bank account and see your Fidelity brokerage account or vice versa from 2001. The, the, the big banks here have really yet to reveal their hand. So I know all of them, all the big banks are working or have already got a proposition in which they are the third party provider. There's a lot of interest in that particular market and in the supermarket banks of um, developing payments, new payments methodologies. So um, the fact that we've got to uh, 3% in the UK, because effectively all of, the, all of the customer base that was in the market, in the live market using the screen scraping model have had to re-platform effectively, meaning they've had to start again from scratch. You know, that there have been some customers that have transitioned and some who have not transitioned. I don't know what the figure is, but it might be no more than 50%. So we've really had to almost begin the entire market again and the fact that we've got to three percent of the whole population when the technology to use it's only really been stable for a year and a bit year and a half and it's really now nearly really now starting to reach a point of maturity the last uk open banking figures had 99.6 percent availability that's starting to get to the level that you need for a payment system not not quite but you know it's maturing technology going back um even a year and a half it was a bit flakier than that yeah. and i really think the fact that we've managed to get to three percent you know a lot of people are saying well why isn't it going faster i think the sort of 30 to 40 percent growth that's been experienced in uk open banking is terrific and market leading and it's because of the qualities of the improving technology that we're able to get to that level and i can only see it going one way mm -hmm. Um, Alex, I'm really keen to, to come to you um, and just sort of really hear, um, oh, sorry, I think it was, uh, I don't know if you heard that, but it was Alexa. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so Alex, just really keen to, to hear, um, you know, what, what is the, the view inside the FCA on, on, on this sort of border issue and balancing security? And, and obviously you've got 
Um, you know, for anyone who is not familiar, you've obviously got the open finance uh, sort of consultation very much, um, you know, ongoing at the moment. But what, what can you give us a sense um, what's going on um, at the eco regulator? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting. I think the conversation so far has been been, been really good to hear. I mean, to starting point, I mean, open open banking in the UK was there to try and foster innovation and competition in the market. I, mean, I think that that's the starting point. I think the UK has taken a very different route to many, many other countries in, in having a, an in, a set of standards that the industry come together around and use. And I think that's a really, really vital part of actually how we make sure that innovation comes through the market. Now, I think certainly in the early days, I think reflecting what Gavin said, I think there were, you know, the use of technology, the use of, of different approaches to actually get the security in place was probably not where it needs to be to make a really smooth customer journey. And I think over time, as, as that technology is being developed, as it becomes more embedded in systems, I think we'll see the user journey really improving. Now, but I think we need to reflect on what this is all about. This is about stopping fraud. And, and, and I think within this, we have two big issues in open banking. One is fraud, and the other is, is consumers and their data and how it's being used and getting them the confidence that actually what happens really works in their interest. So I think, as I think Fabian noted earlier, you know, part of this is about actually having a bit of friction there just so consumers actually know, you know what's happening to their data, how is it being used? So I think that's, that's a really important combination. And we're looking at, we're trying to actually think what do we need to do as a regulator? Where are the regulations actually the barriers to the smooth progress? Uh, and where is it other things? And, I, and I'd really note, I think your link to open, open finance there. Part of the barrier to real consumer take of is always going to be the limitations of how wide open banking is. And this is about payments at the moment. For many people, when they're looking at their banking, when they're looking at how they think these things might be used, they want to move it across credit, products they've got, they want to move it across their mortgage, they want to have a look at what's happening with their investment products. You know, so it's a much wider thing and much wider potential. And I think we'll really see the growth come through at that point. But again, coming back to why is the UK, a, I think, a, such, a, such a great example for many others, starting with those central standards. And I think we need to look at that when we start to expand that going forward. So I think there's some, some real great learnings so far. The technology starting to come through, we're looking at our rules, and I can reflect a bit more on that later. So we're looking at how we can play our part, but certainly it's the tech providers now. They need to come in, they need to really play their part and actually take advantage of a really good system here in the UK. Um, excellent, excellent. And let's not forget a fantastic regulator as well. So, um, <laughs> um, Okay, so let's um, just move to um, talking. Um, got a question here. Um, are the paths currently on offer too rigid to stimulate innovation um, in the payments domain? Um, perhaps, um, uh, Fabian, that's one for you. You repeat the question. Um, so uh, are the paths currently on offer um, too rigid to, at the moment to, to stimulate sort of uh, innovation in the payments domain? You know, could, could they be sort of loosened up a bit? Well, it, it, it all depends on what you think about parts and the definition, really. I mean, we work hard as an industry to to interoperate, uh, right, and and to 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 make sure that we get to this um, uh, frictionless experience. So it it, it uh, you know it we, we are on the start. I mean, we have deadlines all over Europe and in the UK we had deadlines last year, and in September. So we're really starting the learning curve, right? Um, so I think. Uh, talking about rigid, yes, it might be rigid somehow, but we will improve definitely. Uh, this is a journey, and uh, I think Peter was mentioning it. Uh, you know, uh, it's the experience, and the, we will get some more innovation to just loosen up a little bit there. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. maybe I can add a um, bit more. Um, yeah, so it, it's a bit rigid. I think what I'm thinking from payments and how consumers are going to use open banking in payments and innovation in payments. Um, what underpins this one is the security. You know, account information is, yes, it's a type one, but type two is more, you know, uh, fraud and all of the other things comes into picture liability. So for, for us to innovate more on the payments and all of this using open banking, the under, underpinning those one is the security or the authentication. So you need to first innovate on the 
uh, strong customer authentication you know the currently it's all too rigid you know if you wanted to complete a journey you go through a lot of those uh, you know uh, stages to complete and banks at this time is purely interested in getting a tick mark in their compliance journey so that when a regulator comes in yes i've done it and it's all proper and it's all compliant but then banks have to innovate here you know i don't want to, my customer to go through a frictional journey so they need to innovate in strong customer authentication and that's where like products from fabian and a lot of innovation in strong customer you know multi-factor biometric you know risk analysis bio uh, you know uh, behavioral uh, kind of things all of this will innovate and when would that innovation start i think sooner or later it will start and who will it who will start this innovation is the big banks because if they want to get a lot of open banking payments in their channel obviously uh, because the cards channel might eventually i don't know what's going to happen but eventually it will grow at the expense of the cards channel the open banking payments so if that's going to grow and if the big banks wants to get the pie of it they need to innovate on their customer experience so it's too rigid now obviously but the innovation will it will We'll kick start now. Okay, really, really interesting. So, so SCA strong customer authentication. Um, you you see that as a real key um, sort of battleground, I guess, for innovation. Um, anyone else like to sort of come in on that, um, Peter? Perhaps what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, you know, the space is developing, and you know, particularly with the security side, like we've been saying trying to do it in, in the most discreet way possible, but obviously being compliant and making sure uh, we go through all the all the required stages. So yeah, I mean, in agreement with that, it, it's really just trying to make sure that that experience isn't jeopardized to the point where people uh, don't want to use the product um, and, and, and find it too much. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, to the points that were raised as well, they need to be aware um, as well of what they're doing so there needs to be some friction uh, to to some degree to, to make to make sure that the awareness is there so it's yeah it's again getting the balance right and, and trying to make sure it's right for the particular experience that they're going through um, Gavin do you think there are any sort of particular lessons that have been been learned um, so far um, on the sort of SCA journey yeah uh, so I mean if you, if we think back to the second payment services directive. I know it's uh, deeply unpopular to remind everybody, but it was written without APIs in mind. It was written in a way that assumed that the credentials would be um, stored and, and passed through the FinTech interface, uh, otherwise known as credential sharing and screen scraping. Um, the fact that it's moved away from credential sharing, I think is probably a good thing. Um, there were ways to do it to do it safely and effectively where the credentials were shared and there's not been a back history of wide-scale um, technical breach as a result of that but I do think the more modern approach is better and can be handled more efficiently the one thing I would say is that the it, going, going to the, the, the conversation we just had, the, the payments piece in particular, uh, if we're assuming every payment journey that wants to use open banking, PSD2, APIs, call it what you will, is uh, a remote one, um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily going to be true. There's going to be uh, a whole variety of types of journey. It could be that you load open banking onto a piece of plastic. It could be that you want to use open banking in a restaurant when you're paying for a meal or you're you're going through a turnstile at a, an airport or something so there's a, a whole variety of different methods where the current consent flows um could be innovated on i don't think that th there's one one of the big debates we had in in the european commission was whether um standardization was the enemy of innovation and a number of the fintechs thought it was, and a number thought it wasn't. And I guess my perspective is that if you create multiple standards, and what I mean by that is a standard for different approaches, 
then the approaches themselves can be standardized and can be efficiently applied where all parties can use that particular method. It, it's worse if you end up in a situation where every company is trying to create their own methodology and it ends up in a very fragmented, messy user experience where there's no interoperability. So I think uh, exploring more than just the redirection model is a requirement and that looking at decoupled and embedded and trying to make sure that they're both safely executed and properly standardized will lead to greater innovation, particularly in payments. There's not such a big problem in, in information sharing and banking, although as we move into open finance, that, and we'll come on to that later, but that's going to be a very significant issue if we don't standardize across a variety of sectors as we move into open finance. Hmm, interesting. Um, I see sort of uh, heads nodding uh, from Fabian and, and Canon, but Alex, what, what are your thoughts um, on that on that argument? Well, I, I mean, I think a starting point on this, again, is, is keeping the consumer at the heart of everything we're doing here. I think one of the challenges on, on, on open banking payments is to explain to consumer why they should use uh, that method uh, as against the methods they're used to. What's the protections? And again, we, we've spoken a bit here about actually consumers getting confident over time with the security involved. But, but even once you've got the security and the confidence in that, why are they using it? Why not something else? Then the convenience. How does the convenience work? Uh, so I think, you know, when we talk here about that balance between security and customer experience, that's absolutely vital here because consumers have got to be confident in both. And if we don't get both right, there's just no reason for them to use it. They have other ways to make payments. Uh, and so I think that that'll be the thing that we look at going time. But but I think it's it's really key that, that the security is right, because if the security is not right, we'll see a rise in fraud and that will undermine the whole of this. And actually, that's something we all need to avoid. I think in terms of, of the regulations around this, um, the regulations I think are at the moment for, for strong customer authentication quite rigid. Uh, I think that's certainly uh, that they, they lack, I think, some of the flexibility. They offer many options uh, for firms to take it through. But I think, you know, over time, I'm, I'm sure we'll all move to a world where actually we need the regulations to become more flexible because we'll have, we'll have got to a point when security is embedded and everyone are actually get, bringing new technology in and they'll keep to then keep then moving that new tele, technology along to keep it ahead of the frauders, fraudsters. And I think that'll be something we'll need to look at. And at that point, the regulations going to be, need to be a lot more nimble to keep ahead. Otherwise, we'll undermine the whole system here. So I think, you know, from a regulated perspective, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. Mm, really, really interesting. Um, Peter, I'm interested to hear sort of, um, you know, from inside Revolut, um, you know, what, what, are your, what are your users feeling about open banking? I think you're, you're live, um, I think, via TrueLayer in, in quite a few countries. Um, and you know, do, are you finding good uptake? Um, I, I can't remember if you're offering it only to your sort of subscription customers or whether it's for all users. But um, you know, certainly, you know, uh, I think Monzo have made um, open banking a um, a feature of of you know paid for accounts. Um, so yeah, what what how do you, how do your users feel about it? Yeah, so it, yeah, it is it is a big feature, and and we, we do see consistent growth in the area. Um, it, it's it's just you know it fits really well with with how we do things, right? And and, and how we, you know our innovation and our goals, um, and uh, you know our clients obviously really really enjoy using open banking, and that's why we're seeing this growth um, in in the space. I mean, we have you know obviously the payment side has been a big focus um, last year. Um, the last six to eight months, I should say, um, and it's been it's been you know really focused on how to how to integrate that and make that work seamlessly um, as best as possible. I mean, the, the innovations really will be coming in when we're looking at sort of the recurring payments uh, and and um, ways to make payments that will reduce that friction, but you know allow that flexibility as well, um, and you know ensure that the security is there, but sort of in the background um, and seamless. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the data side is really uh, becoming more of a focus this year. Um, and, you know, that's when it gets you know, really interesting, you know, in terms of how you can leverage that data and how you can use that to to offer, uh, you know, custom products. And then the financial data is obviously key to that and making sure that um, it, it's used, uh, you know, effectively in that space. So, yeah, definitely steady growth and the reoccurring and the data side, I think, are the, the areas also, they need to get some focus. 
Um, we, we passed the halfway mark um, with our time. So uh, just a reminder on quest on if anyone wants to ask a question from the audience, um, obviously we'll we'll um, go to them at the end, but we'll also be you know weaving in anything relevant um, as we go. And uh, we actually have one one question that's coming through from uh, Alan. You know, obviously, please do tell us your um, your your full name or your company. We'll give you a, a shout out. But um, Alan asks, um, does open finance require open banking like uh, legislation or uh, merely need a sort of inter industry consumer interest to motivate uh, relevant propositions using private and public APIs. Um, anyone like to, to go for that one? Um, Gavin? Yeah, so I mean, uh, as a trade association, FDA has been campaigning for open finance for now eight years. And the only way we foresee it working effectively is with a proper um, government policy in any territory where it's functioned. Um, whilst I mentioned uh, earlier that the market penetration had grown very effectively in the United States, the, um, the development of regulatory policy has not kept up uh, until very recently the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau decided to bring forward a plan to provide market participants and customers with rights and that, that those rights are effectively the right to choose to share your data with a, a, a regulated actor of your choosing. The problem is in New Zealand and Japan and the United States where they've not had that, we could end in a situation where you may build a world-class API technology, but the, the bank, for example, or the, the uh, pension fund or the insurer can simply choose to set a price point for access that no one will pay. So we've seen in all the initiatives where there's not a properly constructed uh, liability framework, uh, right of explicit consent, right to share, proper privacy legislation, that this never gets done in a very effective way. And it ends up in a competition between the highly technical businesses that want to be in the market and the uh, tired businesses that are not innovating very quickly and whose choice is to stay out of the market to avoid competition. So actually, the only way to do this effectively is to mandate it and to make sure that everybody pays. And when everybody pays, the unit cost of payment going, goes down and you're able to reuse centralized services like the ones we've created in open banking, like the trust framework, like the customer address system. And once you're able to reuse those capabilities across multiple sectors, you get to a point where you can actually do this properly and you get a cohesive customer experience out of it that looks after the customer when things go well, as well as when they don't. Interesting. Um, let's move to talk on the 90-day the uh, re-authentication um, rule. Um, I guess you know. Should it be removed? Is is it a, is it currently a barrier? Um, uh, you know, obviously there's there's sort of uh, obvious friction there. Um, Canon, what are what are your thoughts on on that? Um, I think you're on mute. Uh, by and large, it's kind of a frictional in the fintech community. But then the banks uh, have uh, their own way of justifying why it's needed. And then regulators also, you know, expect something uh, on the on this like 90 day reorg. Um, I think it, it is a frictional journey, but, you know, um, but over time with the maturity, there could be a revision to this. Um, they, we, are, we are continuously debating this uh, 90 day rule for the last two years, three years. I think eventually, one, once they see there is no um, breach or or fraud or any of those ones, and if the technology is maturing, maybe re regulators would would not would reconsider this. Maybe it's a question for Alex as well. <laughs> uh, you know how he sees the trend goes going. You know he, he they, they are talking to the fintech community and then the banking community, and they keep consumers at the heart. So maybe Alex can add some more. Happy to, to dip in this one. Of course, we are actually consulting at the moment on uh, on removing the 90-day reauthentication rule for, for this very reason. Look, I, and I think, you know, 
let's start by by thinking again from the consumer's uh, viewpoint here. Um, clearly, uh, if a consumer is not using a service, has forgotten they've authenticated something, then it, it's not a great outcome for them if their data continues to be used over time. Uh, and, and I think for us, that, that is the backstop concern that we have. So, so we are consulting, as I said, at the moment on looking to remove that rule. Um, and, and instead, what we think is that actually the, the third party provider simply needs to make sure they reconfirm the customer's explicit consent every 90 days. So, so that's not about putting it through uh, SCA every 90 days, but actually making sure the customer still wants the third party provider to use their data. And we think that's a, a pretty decent uh, outcome. Now, of course, you'll still have to do SCA when you first enter. Um, but I think that will remove quite a bit of the friction if, if, if on, on reflection, when we finish our consultation, we decide to, to take that forward. But, but I think we, we've certainly heard about this. And as I said, across a number of different areas in our consultation, what we're trying to do is reflect where we see regulatory barriers that simply aren't required. Then they're not actually helping the customer. And there's other ways to do the same outcome with less friction. So, so hopefully we're, we're dealing with that problem, um, but I, I'm sure there'll be other problems that emerge over time that, that'll come up that we have to, to change as well. And in part, I think that's a reflection on technology changes. And as, as technology changes, some of the problems that we used to have won't be the same, and some of the regulations will no longer fit and we'll need to review them. Hmm. Interesting just to think about the uh, driver for this uh, at the, when this was written into the uh, development of the um, the strong customer authentication RTS uh, by the European Banking Authority, they'd uh, written in that the uh, driver for this was to improve security. And there was uh, a push by the fintech community to extend it or remove it, and a push by the banking community at the time to make the period shorter. And there was also concerns about GDPR and whether there was, you know, uh, suitable consent that the bank could rely on, which was why many wanted the authentication to take place in the bank. So the bank was aware that the customer had asked for it. Otherwise, they, they were arguing they might be in breach of GDPR by sharing. It's been a really complicated thing because uh, this has no security permutations. Nobody in the right mind would hold on to a right of access if you're criminally intended and not make use of it within a 90 day window. So the, the security benefits of, of making this adjustment are trivial, but the, um, the competition elements are serious. There's a number of things that could be done by fintechs or third party providers, which are not high engagement models, or there are models where you provide an alert to the customer on a given action. And of course, if you cannot rely on the fintech to take that action because you may have forgotten to re-authenticate at the bank, then you could not rely on those services. So the sorts of alerts and prompts and nudges and those sorts of interesting fintech models that you could do during the pre-regulated regime, you no longer can do in the 90-day re-off. And it gives the, the bank, who never loses contact with their customer's data, a clear competitive advantage versus the fintech in the AISP model. The other thing that's actually material is business attrition. I, I mentioned earlier, 3% of the UK population now using open banking. Well, that would be 6% had it not been for the 90 day issue. The levels of attrition that are sustained by the fintechs who are having to uh, live with this at the moment is simply unsustainable and many of them have been preparing to go out of business. So whilst they've been funneling marketing money and great innovation in at the front end, you simply cannot keep the customer re-authenticating if every week or two, if they've got many accounts attached, they have to go all around the houses and try to remember to connect and reconnect every bank over and over again. It's, a, it's not a fair amount of friction for the TPPs and it leads to a poor customer experience and in fact, uh, it creates a, a range of harms to the customer if things they thought were going to happen don't happen because they got timed out. I completely agree, Gareth. I, I, would, I would question, I, think, I do think there is some potential harm though from, from data being held by, by TPPs 
after a customer no longer thinks it's being held. I mean, that, that means data is continually to feed through potential future security breaches where data that the customer doesn't realize is being held. Um, and I, that's why I think it's still important the customer actually consents and make sure they, they really understand where their data is going. I think another thing we'd like to see in, in, in the medium term is, is more use of, of consent dashboards. So, so consumers have a clearer idea of who's getting their data for what purposes and the ability to switch it off if they no longer want the data to be shared. And just to add there, um, I think it's, it's more people have got into a lot of uh, connection to the banks and they're not actively using it. This is the primary reason for, why, why we are discussing this. I think there could be difference. I mean, this is a consultation going on. But if, if the fintech is able to prove that, the, fin, um, that uh, the bank customers or the fintech users are actively consuming this data, you know, there, there are something called customer present scenario. You know, not like offline, take the data four times a day, and, but, but this is like real customer being present and refreshing all these accounts. So if the FinTech can prove to the uh, bank that the customer is actively using this service, you know, and we're not just pulling behind the scene all the data, maybe there could be a reason. Uh, we could, I mean, you know, the regulator might say, yes, we could consider that. Maybe we can give them a longer, you know, um, reauth or re-consent period. Um, but but th this is something we have to address, you know, as part of this consultation that's happening. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know just to give my two cents, I guess, from a, from a journalistic uh, perspective, but, you know, you, you can sort of imagine the negative headlines as well if people were, you know, surprised to learn that they their data was being used and, and you know perhaps they'd forgotten um, or didn't you know necessarily understand you know that that's obviously not a great look um, for for the sector as well um, but I just want to um, obviously we we are um, moving towards um, the end of the campfire um, and I really want to to just um, examine the the uh, and understand the importance of uh, digital um, ID, um, in this, uh, you know, in this scenario, um, what part do we, you know, do we think um, sort of an agile, innovative fintech sector has to play in uh, digital identification, verification, and can open banking help innovate um, that? Um, who wants to, to go on to go for that one? Uh, maybe a word on that, um, Daniel, but um, of course, uh, digital ID and goes hand in hand with SEA and it's a pillar of innovation and a thriving digital digital economies. And yes, I think open banking and fintechs have a role to play there, but you have to look at, you, you need a strong uh, government sponsorship. I mean, there's nothing that you can do because digital ID has to be widespread in the population to for it to work. And if you look at what has been done in the Nordics, for instance, uh, you know, governments supported uh, digital ID and work with the large banks uh, around uh, bank ID like initiatives. And th this was a huge success. And now big banks are delivering uh, digital IDs. You know, we trusted them with our money. Now we, you know, they seem to trust them with, you know, with them, um, uh, with digital IDs. And I think fintechs could, you know, play a role there and, and it's 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 going to bring massive uh, advantages to to not just to the entire economy uh, uh, but to, you know to to financial to the financial sector in particular and banking in particular look like you, you could actually remove kyc uh, cumbersome processes because you have digital id in place and and bring new services or extend your services as a bank to external users just to add a bit of a relation to the previous discussion, if there was a, a bank or bank ID kind of a scenario, federated identity, and then a, a consent dashboard, you know, uh, across the banks, then you could just have the app and do the reauthentication once, and you can just go and you know connect to all the banks. But we don't have that scenario now. It's all decentralized, which means each bank has their own SEA and they have their own consent panel. So when you want to do the 90 day, you have to go to all the banks and re-authenticate and come back. But if there was a 
you know, centralized identity and centralized concern dashboard. That could be a different scenario. I Means maybe Gavin can add this kind of things from you know pensions dashboard. You know that there you have a different way of delivering the service. Um, so, um, but going back to the question, digital identity. Maybe for our market, digital identity is a long way. But on the digital identity verification, like EKYC, this is a, a low hanging fruit, you know, um, you can just immediately realize the benefit of it. Within OBI, there is extended attributes, uh, you know, um, of, the, uh, of the identity that's being discussed by a small group. Um, so they are making a lot of progress. Um, so there's been draft that is released and it's kind of supported by the banks themselves, you know. And so, so there is, on the EKYC, we are pretty much there. Uh, we just have to leverage this as, as possible. And it's already done by a lot of, uh, you know, rental payments uh, and, uh, you know, the tenant verifications and a lot of these things are already done. And I've seen the use cases. Interesting. Um, I just want to, to split the question a bit. Um, are we seeing enough innovation um, sort of always, always seeing an equal amount um, between SME customers and consumers, and you know the re the retail customer. Um, is you know are is there enough? Um, you know, uh, perhaps Peter, that's that's one one for you. Um, Revolut, you obviously have business customers as well. Um, is there an even sort of uh, upward trend um, for for this? I think so. Yeah, there's definitely capacity there, and, and we can see obviously that the growth um, that we're seeing that yeah, there's definitely potential. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, to the identification point uh, for the original question, I mean, that there is, it's very much uh, to do with the points that have been raised. So it's the centralisation um, and the cooperation and collaboration efforts, um, and you know, mandating um, the standards for everyone to work towards. That's really the, the key point. Um, and if we want to be using open banking as a platform to actually identify people, then that's absolutely key to make sure that the standards for doing that are, are all uh, agreed and uh, you know collaborated uh, properly. Because you know otherwise you don't have that platform to build on, right? Um, and it's essential to make sure that we get those basics right before we can start building you know the open banking platform as an identi identity identity platform. Mm. Um, we are fast running out of time. Um, Alex, I, I'm really keen to um, just hear from yourself. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're all very much interested in where things are going in the future. Um, you know, here in the UK, obviously, we are um, seeing an element of uh, change in, in obviously the, the Brexit. Um, is there a sense that, or can you give us a sense of any potential divergence from PSD2? But generally, where where do you see regulation then? Thanks. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think even before we we'd left Europe, uh, we we diverged in in some ways from from European, not least in the implementation timetables for SCA, where uh, we we didn't agree with our European colleagues. Over, the, over a doable timeline. I think then if, if you look across other ways in which we've implemented uh, PSD2, I mean, largely in the UK through open banking implementation entity having such a major role, the use of APIs, again, these are quite a divergence from, from the way in which Europe actually pushed this forward. And then if you start then looking at, okay, how are the rules and, and where, where are we standing on that? And again, I, I say this is one of the, the forebearers of, 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 of the UK diverging in ways from Europe. So. We've already talked about 90 day reauth uh, and the fact that we're consulting on potentially shifting that. We're also consulting on, on, on raising the contactless limit as an exemption from, from SCA, again, diverging from, from our European partners there. So, so in many ways, I think we've shown an openness uh, in the UK to look at how the regulations work in practice, how it works with the technology. Does it deliver the innovation and competition that we want to see from this? And if it doesn't, let's diverge, let's, let's move. But at the same time, we have to take into account what firms think and what firms want. And for a lot of cases, this is international businesses. They don't want the UK to be operating on a completely different framework to the rest of Europe. They want to be able to operate businesses across the national borders. So we have to bear that in mind, have to work very closely with our European partners to make sure that actually 
as we move forward, as we react to actually the circumstances we see here in the UK, we also take into account actually their international businesses with international customers. So as we go forward, I think when we look at the regulation here, for me, and you, you mentioned now our, our call for input on, on open finance, uh, of course, Bayes Department here in the UK are looking to give to Treasury powers uh, to make it, it compulsory for firms to actually provide data as part of open finance. I think this is the next major front here. I think as we move forward, it's about how do we expand what consumers can use in sharing their data and getting services that meet their needs. And I can see going forward the ability to switch products, the ability to shift money between debt and credit, uh, between uh, across accounts to pay off your mortgage earlier, to get financial advice more easily. These are some really, really big technological solutions that come in that could change the way that consumers interact with financial services. These are massive wins. And I think from a regulated perspective, we have to move very, very nimbly to keep up actually with emerging technology and to make sure we're not the barrier to that, while at the same time fulfilling our core role, protecting consumers, making sure the conduct of the industry actually ensures consumers to the heart of everything we do. So it's a really difficult time going ahead um, with a number of different challenges, but, but I think it's a really quite exciting time actually here for, from a regulatory perspective, I'm sure for, for industry players as well. Hmm. Really interesting. Um, we, I think we've got about um, four minutes left. Um, I notice um, a question has come in from um, uh, Bronwyn Boyle. Um, I think it's actually more, more of a sort of shout out, but um, Bronwyn Boyle is head of security and counter fraud at the open banking, open banking implementation entity. And she just says that she's keen to flag that they are collaborating uh, uh, and also partnered with IASME on a uh, counter fraud fundamentals certification scheme to help raise the bar across financial services. And she's very keen to um, uh, share details on that. Sorry, I think I actually read that wrong. There's actually three messages and they're slightly in the wrong order, which is uh, quite confusing, but she's keen to flag that, we're, that they are collaborating with the ecosystem on initiatives to fight fraud. And they just launched a tool to help open banking participants assess maturity of their counter fraud controls. Um, so that's clear. Um, <clears throat> Helen, do we do we have time for more questions? Um, Daniel, please keep the conversation going. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more um, what Fabian and, and Gavin have to say to follow up um, uh, Alex's comment. We, we, we've, we can put some more money in the meter. It doesn't stop. Please keep the conversation going. Um, so uh, Fabian, what, what are your thoughts on um, the very juicy details that Alex has um, uh, told us? Well, I think this is this is great that the things are moving forward and, and beyond regulation, I think we have to keep in mind that there is great balance between security and, and putting, uh, you know, people uh, and consumers at the heart of what we're doing. I mean, we see open banking uh, growing everywhere else in the world and there's no PSD2, uh, but there are still, you know, people are still wary about security. So you still do have, you know, to <laughs> this equation that we're talking about at the beginning, you know, to handle great user experience and uh, the right amount of security and the risks are paramount. I mean, the risks are growing, whether you have regulation or not, right? Um, so I think as an industry, we are, we, we, I think we're quite clever at what we're doing and we, we can work together to find out solutions just like, you know, what was happening with open banking before PSD2 in the UK. So I think we are, we are, we are on, on, a good, um, on a good path. And, and uh, key, key as well, I think, uh, is to, to give the banks and issuers, uh, you know, ways to really roll out um, great solutions. Uh, I think that's that's why you know Canon from Banfico and myself we, we work together just to, to to provide this, you know, this innovation in the ecosystem that we bring, uh, you know, solutions beyond regulation. Canon, mm -hmm. um, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about the collaboration. Uh, sorry, on me on mute actually. Not again. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So strong customer so, authentication is, uh, you know, is probably focal point of all this, you know, trust ecosystem. There are some trust ecosystem that we have put in place for the people to interact together, but then that is standardized and it's all working fine. But it's just the touch point with the consumer that is a strong customer authentication 
and there you don't have one rule and things you know because based on what banks are offering so far they have to kind of improve the security element of it so if you look at a lot of them and um, banks especially i i work with we work with a lot of uh, uh, tier two tier three banks a lot of them used sms otp and you know old way of authentication but there are like cool innovations um, that they can bring to the table and you know integrate quickly so what we have done with the uh, okay is uh, um, for a, a bank poc we built all of this uh, and and the bank was really happy to see how quickly you can roll out and there are industry partners uh, you know um, who could collaborate together and give a you know point solution because you, you don't want to go to a bank and say go and do your own procurement and then come to us and integrate and it's not going to work you know you need to deliver quickly and you need to have less delivery risk and less delivery time and when we had this cooperation and, and we showed showcased they were really impressed you know otherwise they have to do all of that things themselves and it's too complex for them if i would say because smaller banks don't have the subject matter experts in all of this thing so they're kind of getting a, a you know um, turnkey solution in a way so that, that that's the you know highlight of our corporate uh, collaboration yeah. turnkey or pre-integrated ecosystem of best of breed as i like to put it you know uh, <laughs> tackling very you know complex issues but in, in a simple way as as uh, can I put it do i have time just to touch on digital id Go for it, Gavin. Yeah, so Alex uh, mentioned the uh, initiative by uh, Business Energy and Industrial Strategy to bring forward smart data. If we're going to move from open banking where identity is relatively easy to handle because there's large market penetration of consumers that have AML'd and KYC'd and can digitally access their accounts, enabling the redirection model to be facilitated uh, for, for that authentication to take place. In other markets, as we move to open finance and beyond to open life, where we add in things like energy, telco, um, pensions, investments, insurance, there's not necessarily the same market penetration of um, digital connectedness. And the challenge, therefore, is that without digital ID, some ubiquitous pathway to that, there's going to be financial exclusion. There's going to be a raft of different forms of economic crime that tiptoe into the gaps where we don't have a, a, a elegant solution. And I think it's really important from the UK perspective that we do put in the effort now to try and make sure that we build on the uh, DCMS published trust alpha trust framework that came out earlier this week and actually as an industry now build out to make sure that we meet that and don't um, end up in a situation where the end customer has to carry a huge chain of keys in their pocket to access across their financial and other digital life. To that end on the 2nd of March there's a cross industry initiative that contains all of the regulatory authorities in the UK, including the ICO, the quasi regulators like Pay.UK, OBIE, Pensions Dashboard, plus the government departments, Treasury, DCMS, and so on, and all of the financial services trade associations in a room together trying to work out what the, what the clear pathways are to enable us to work with more alignment as we develop the uh, digital ID connections for the UK economy. Um, hopefully that leads to where all these different initiatives have taken place, and there are many now, that we don't end up in a position that becomes too fragmented too early, and that working with the regulatory authorities and the government departments, we're now able to wrestle it back into some sort of consistent pathway going forward. Um, in terms of the international alignment, if I may be so bold for one more go. Fred. On the 10th of March, we have the uh, Global Open Finance Centre of Excellencies uh, Technical Standards Working Group has its first meeting, and that includes the uh, technical standards groups from many markets, including now Nigeria, Chile, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, 
US, Canada, in the European Union, both the Berlin Group and STET, from the UK, OBIE, Pensions Dashboard, TISA, Pay.UK, uh, the, the Russians are involved, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Indians, and there's going to be many more markets before we get to the 10th of March, seeking to align on the security profiles that enable the um, for companies that are operating in more than one market to be able to connect in a consistent fashion and uh, working on the uh, threat and attacker model for how APIs are compromised and providing a service to write the mathematical proofs between the written standards and the a digital library of APIs and the threat and attacker model with a hope to also then improve via certification and conformance testing with an end goal of getting to a completely standardized international API environment to remove uh, friction from trade, reduce engineering overhead and uh, make it easier for companies to reduce their threat posture. So that's taking place on the 10th of March, kickoff meeting of all the groups, the Scrum of Scrums. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, Daniel, uh, please, absolutely superb. Do you have any final words before I wrap up, please? Well, I mean, you know, given the opportunity, I, I would encourage everybody to download um, Altfi's uh, State of the Market um, report into digital banking. Um, from the, the very tail end of last year. Um, I think actually there's a there's some sort of uh, box or advert on the um, on the OBE page for this event. So you can find it there, but you can also find it at Altfi under our research tab. Um, and obviously, you know, if anyone wants to get in touch and, and um, do so, then I'm very findable on uh, LinkedIn and obviously on Twitter. Uh, at PJ Lanyon on Twitter, um, not my uh, second profession, just my initials. <laughs> Daniel, absolutely superb, and you worked hard um, uh, being our guest host, so you deserved uh, that uh, shout out. Everybody can see the, the GIF at the side of the page, and they can download um, your, your report there as well. Um, I would like to say, wow, that was a colossal conversation and clearly the right time to have this conversation, given that we're during uh, going through the FCA uh, consultation. And Alex, thank you very much for being so generous and so open. It is just wonderful to, to have a regulator um, that it just wants to come uh, and talk and to be so generous with your time. So a big thank you uh, for that. Um, there is so much to, to say and so much to unpack and reflect upon. So may I suggest that um, when Nikki posts this uh, recording online, we'll post it on LinkedIn, you um, have the option to download and view it on demand, but you also share it. Clearly, we are right to continue this conversation throughout the year. It's the first time ever we have run over time, um, but I think it absolutely warrants it. So please do share that uh, link. Let's collaborate as a community and, and keep this conversation going. Um, I actually think it would be appropriate for me to say um, just a little bit of a shout out for Eversheds, Eversheds Sutherlands. They're offering free clinics uh, to support our OBE community. So if you've got any burning questions, particularly around fraud and security, um, maybe you would like to get in touch with them, get in touch with me at uh, hello at um, openbankingexcellence.org and you can speak to Phil James, their partner in global security and um, uh, global privacy. That should have been partner in cyber security and global privacy. Okay, so um, it's clearly very relevant for this conversation. All that remains for me is to say thank you for tuning in, thank you for your company and Thank you so much for such an awesome panel. Absolutely. Um, super, super generous uh, with your time and your authoritative insight. Um, and finally, um, on a personal note, a big thank you for the OBE team for everything that you do behind the scenes to make this and all those connections with purpose that we do behind the scenes that nobody sees. So thank you very much. Uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, look after each other and uh, bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>